I was talking to a couple of our church members this morning. They came in and I said, how are you doing? And I asked one of them, I said, hey, are you, uh, are you still working from home? And that church member said, yes, I am. I'm pretty much everything's from home. And I turned to the spouse. I said, now, how about you? Said, no, pastor, I, I have to go in and so forth there. And uh, he says, you know, they need, and I said, yeah, I guess so, because you know, I know he's kind of work. He's helped us in our church and certain things. And I said, yeah, I understand your work. You have to go there. You probably have to be on site. He said, not only that, he says, just, I, he says, I do that to give my wife peace and quiet. Amen, you know? He said, she turned and she said, oh, yeah, he, he could be pretty noisy when he's home. I have to get him out of the house so I can concentrate. All of us are familiar when we do certain things that background noise can be a little bit distracting, amen? Brother Eugene said, oh yeah, that's not good, Brother Eugene. <laughs> and you could be on a phone conversation or you could be trying to engage yourself on something and you, know, you have your little AirPods on and you know what I'm gonna say here. Sometimes it doesn't cancel out the background noise. So some of our members intelligently buy these speaker, these headphones that advertise they have they are noise canceling headphones. And they're advertised they, black, they, they, they drown out or they block off all of the background noise so you can concentrate on what you're hearing. Background noise is sometimes called an interference. And interference is defined as to come into opposition as one thing with another, especially with the effect of hampering an action or procedure. It can also mean taking part or involving oneself in the affairs of other people, or sometimes the synonym that's used to describe an interference is meddling, to meddle with or in, when someone interferes with another person's matters with the sole purpose of adversely affecting the outcome or the decision. And I say to adversely affect the outcome or decision, that is called meddling. We have in our passage tonight a story about meddling. Let's see what the Bible says about that. I want you to see four things very quick tonight, very teaching lesson. Number one, I want you to see the presumptuous. The presumptuous. Two kings. Jehoash in verse one, who's the king of Israel. Amaziah, the son of Joash, who that Joash was a good king, who his servants at the tail end killed him, they assassinated him. Amaziah is the king of Judah, two kings. Jehoash, king of Israel, Amaziah, king of Judah. They're both young men. Our focus is on Amaziah. In verses three to five, we're told that Amaziah did that which is right in the sight of the Lord. That's a good thing, amen? You wanna do things that are right in the sight of the Lord. Now, but God also wanted us to understand even though he did things right in the sight of the Lord, he didn't go all the way. The Bible says, not like unto his father David. So he did that was right in the sight of the Lord, but not like David. And part of the problem here is verse four, he did not take away the high places. There were still places of idol worship that were still present in the kingdom. And the people still sacrificed and burned incense in the high places, okay? When the kingdom got confirmed in Amaziah's hands, the first thing he did was go after the assassins who conspired together, the servants who conspired together and killed his father, Joash. He slew those men. He did not slay their children. He understood the principle found in Deuteronomy 24, that every man is responsible for his own sins, that, that, that the father must be responsible for himself, the son must be responsible for himself, so he didn't go after them. And so he took, to, he took care of matters having to deal with those people that had conspired against his father. And then we're told about, in verse seven, a very noteworthy deed. The Bible wants us to understand his va how, how courageous he was, how, how great a military leader he was, and how successful he was. And the Bible says he went to the Valley of Edom, to the Valley of Salt, 
where the Edomites were, and he went to battle with the Edomites because the Edomites, they were distant cousins who were adversaries to Israel. And the Bible says he went to the Valley of Saul. And the only other man that did something like this was Joab because Joab did something very similar. So he followed on the heels of Joab. And this was considered something extremely courageous and extremely heroic. He went to battle with these Edomites and he slew 10,000 of them in the Valley of Saul. Now you might have read this verse very, very many times and just passed over it, but that is an incredibly noteworthy heroic deed this man did. He went into an area geographically that was very difficult to fight in. He went into an area taking, taking control of a situation where he fought with the opposition with the main intent. It may be difficult, but we're going there to win. Well, now he's filled with an incredible amount of pride and arrogance. He became presumptuous in his abilities. He became overconfident. Man, I whipped those, those Edomites, 10,000 of them. I'm pretty good. I've got a good army. And so Israel and Judah are adversaries. He issues a challenge to the king of Israel. It's almost like this in street language. Hey, boy, let's look each other in the face. I'll meet you on the corner there. He says to Joash, Come, let us look one another in the face. He says, he said, uh, it was almost like saying, you know, you're a coward, Joash, and, uh, and I'm pretty strong. I'm not a coward. I want to see you face to face. I'm going to whip up on you. Joash is, isn't even phased by this challenge. Joash responds back by saying, send him a message. I don't have time to see him. Send him a text message, you know. <laughs> Tell him I don't have time for him. And he does so by way of a parable. Now, if you know anything about Lebanon in the Bible, Lebanon was known for growing great, great cedar trees. Now, cedar trees symbolically are, are, are beautiful. Uh, you know, on one end, a cedar tree goes straight up. A cedar tree is very strong. And cedar trees going, uh, you know, when you look at them, that their, their stateliness are, are, is a picture of what God wants for our spiritual life. He wants us to go, he wants us to grow up. He wants to be strong. He wants us pointing to heaven like the trees are pointing to heaven. I mean, it's just great, great, great symbolism there. And cedar trees were well known as being very hard wood that was used for construction. And so he says here, he gives this parable and he talks about a little thistle. He says, the thistle that was in Lebanon sent to the cedar that was in Lebanon Give thy daughter to my son to wife. Now, it's a very absurd, very preposterous parable. A little thistle. Give me, to saying to, to a cedar tree, give me your daughter to wife. He says, I deserve what you have. You're going to turn your daughter over to me. And it's basically slapping in the face Joash by saying, you know what? You know, or, or Joash slapping in the face Amaziah by saying, you know what? You're just a punk. <laughs> he just said, you're just a little guy. And he says, you're nobody, and you're asking to face me in battle. He says, and he says, okay, you're like that little, that little thistle coming to, uh, uh, coming to me, coming to me who is, who is a cedar tree, and saying, give your daughter to me to wife. And he, says, and he says, as he did so, a wild beast came by and trode upon the thistle and destroyed it. And he takes that parable, which was basically a slap in the face of Amaziah. And he tells him this. Look at the next verse. He said, okay, Amaziah, verse 10, you have indeed smitten Edom, and thy heart has lifted thee up. He says, you've become narcissistic. You're arrogant. You become every overconfident. You're presuming upon yourself that because you beat the Edomites in the Valley of Edom, that you can beat Israel. You're presuming upon yourself that you're so great that you can do it all by yourself. You're so filled with pompousness and overconfidence, you think you can handle every situation without it backfiring on you. That's what he's saying. And he said, now listen, he said, go ahead and glory about this, but stay home. Do not come into Israel. Glory of this and tarry at home. In other words, he's saying, son, you better mind your own business. You better stay home. 
That's what he's saying to him. And notice the question he, he poses at him. Why shouldest thou meddle to thy hurt that thou shouldest fall, even thou and Judah with thee? He's saying, why are you causing controversy? Why are you interfering with my affairs? Why are you becoming meddlesome? He says, did you know when you do that, you're going to fall? And only are you going to fall, you're going to bring everybody else down with you? Well, you think Amaziah listened? Absolutely not. That just, that just, that's just poured gasoline on the fire. You know what I'm saying? And he went forward. The Bible says, verse 11, and by the way, aren't you, aren't, you, aren't you thankful how God has worded everything in the Bible? He begins, verse 11, and says, but Amaziah would not hear. Now, some of you tonight are gonna be listening to this message, and when I get to the end, you're not gonna hear. I hope you hear tonight. He that hath an ear, the Bible says, let him hear. He would not hear. Therefore, Joash, king of Israel, went up. He and Amaziah, king of Judah, looked one another in the face at Bethshemesh. So he said, okay, I'll come up. I'll come to Judah. I'll meet you at Bethshemesh. They met there. And the Bible says in verse 12, Judah was put to the worst before Israel. All the men of Judah fled to their tents. Joash took Amaziah captive. He whipped him. And he went to Jerusalem to make matters even more embarrassing. So I'm not just going to take you, king. He went from Bethlehem up to Jerusalem. He marched his way up to that. Remember I said this morning, Jerusalem's a city on a hill. The Bible says he broke down the wall of Jerusalem, beginning at the gate of Ephraim to the corner gate. To prove his point that Amaziah made a bad decision, by meddling in affairs he should not have been. He went there, put him to the worst. He defeated him. All the men of Judah ran and hid in their tents. The city had no one there to guard it and to, and to fortify it. And easily Joash went and broke down the wall to the tune or to the length of 600 feet. The equivalent of two football fields. That's a lot of, that's a lot of wall, Amen. That's a lot of wall. He broke down the equivalent of the length of two, of two football fields, 450 cubits, or if you were 400 cubits, whatever it is there, he said 600 feet of wall. Now, now he's infiltrated the city. And the Bible says, verse 14, he took all the gold and the silver and all the vessels that found in the house of God and all the treasures, he took some hostages, he took all the back to Samaria. The man was put to the worst the presumptuous, he was overconfident, narcissistic, arrogant about his victory. We're not done yet. Notice number two. I want you to see the principle. Go with me to 1 Peter 4. Go with me to 1 Peter 4. Would you do that, please? Say amen if you're with me. We see a principle, we see a precept. It's more of a precept than a principle. Go with me to verse 12. Beloved, think it not strange concerning the fiery trial, which is to try you, as though some strange thing happened unto you. But rejoice, inasmuch as you are partakers of Christ's sufferings, that when his glory should be revealed, ye may be glad also with exceeding joy. If ye be reproached for the name of Christ, happy are ye. For the spirit of glory and of God rested upon you. On their part he's evil spoken of, but on your part he's glorified. But let none of you suffer as a murderer or as a thief or as an evildoer or as a busybody in other men's matters. There's a precept here. The context in verses 12 to 17 is co coincides with the entire theme of 1 Peter, suffering and fiery trials. 
the believers that Peter's writing to were going through fiery trials. A fiery trial, the word trial, it means we're going through a difficult moment, difficult time, affliction. The word fiery added to it adds intensity to it. It's a very intense trial. Uh, it's an intense time of affliction, testing, and suffering. Uh, trials speak about the testings God puts in our life there, okay? Uh, it pictures the idea of being in a fiery furnace. I think that's what Peter had in mind. When he talked about fiery trials, it's about being in a fiery furnace. Charles Spurgeon said this. He said, he said, fiery trials make golden Christians. So God, without trials, without trials, we're not gonna grow our faith. Uh, without trials, we're not gonna learn about the grace of God. Without trials, we don't wanna understand how faithful God is. That's why God puts trials in our life. They're not comfortable. They're not easy. They're not difficult. They make you sweat bullets. They make you, you, you have sleepless nights. You have difficult times. You lose your appetite. You get discouraged. You get down in the mouth. You find it difficult to pray. Yep, all of those things. Why? Because God puts fiery trials in life so that we can come to God. God uses, listen, I say this all the time. We must pray like we're in a trial or God sends us trials to teach us to pray. Now notice some things here about this. I'm gonna to get to the precept here. The first thing we notice in verse 12 is the reality of suffering. He says, think it not strange concerning the fiery trial. You know what he's saying there? Lord, why are you doing this to me? That's what we say, isn't it? Why is this happening to me? Oh, woe is me. He said, brethren, and these were brethren dispersed. They're called the diaspora. They're dispersed everywhere. They're homeless. They, they had to leave their possessions. They had to leave their houses. They had to leave their jobs. They had to leave all those things, and now they're just kind of scattered throughout Cappadocia and all these other places. I mean, they're unsettled. These are set, these are pilgrims. They're experiencing the pilgrim life. They're strangers and pilgrims, Peter said. And Peter said, there's the reality. Think it not strange concerning the fiery trials, which is to try you. It's not a matter if trials will come. It's, a, it's not a matter if they will come. It's a matter of when they will come. He says, think it not strange concerning the fiery trial, which is to try you, as though some strange thing happened to you. Now, I'm not saying this in a caustic way or hard way. I just want to understand. There's the reality. We're going to have trials. We're going to have trials. And they hurt. And we can feel the heat. And they're intense. And they're difficult. But thank God, every trial we get is Father filtered, amen? amen? They're a gift from God. We don't understand it in the beginning, but there's a reality. He says, think it not strange. He tells us the second thing. He tells us our response in suffering. Look at verse 13. What's he say? Rejoice. Thank you, Jesus. Rejoice inasmuch as you are partakers of Christ's sufferings, that when his glory should be revealed, you may be glad also with exceeding joy. Now he's talking about the present, he's talking about the future. He says, you know, when, when, when the Lord comes, he says there's a great reward that he promises that in James 1.12. He talks about this crown that he's gonna give to everyone who, who just, who endures their suffering. He says, our response should be, we should, be, we should rejoice. He says, he says in verse 14, if you repre be reproached for the name of Christ, if you're suffering because you're serving Jesus Christ, happy are ye. Now, I'm gonna tell you our response. Listen to me tonight, look up here. Somebody who goes out on the limb and takes a little bit of risk and does something for Jesus, they use something that's not conventional to you and me. You know, convention to us is, well, our, you know, our church has door-to-door -door soul winning and we invite people to these evangelistic meetings. That's fine, but there's a lot of ways, there's a lot of different ways we reach people with the gospel, okay? In old days, men like John Wesley would go out in the field and they did what we call, they would do open-air preaching. There could be open-air preaching. There could be track passing on the streets. There could, be, there could be taking a stand against somebody, okay? Whatever it may be, you know, we, 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 you know when, we, when somebody suffers for Jesus Christ, our typical response, if it's not conventional, we typically are the ones afflicting them and saying, why did you do that? Did you know you put us at risk? Did you know if you're gonna witness for Jesus Christ, there's always gonna be risk? The day will come, brethren. It's already here. We preach against abortion, we take a stand for the gospel. Government may come, slap our wrists. But hey, did you know a lot of our churches, our independent Baptist churches that opened up when COVID was shut? I know a lot of them. They opened up and they were fined every single week. They were fined. 
And some of us would look with our pharisaical noses up in the air and say, oh, well, they should have stayed closed. No, they should have stayed open. They should have honored God. They did the right thing. And he says, you know, if you're the one suffering for Jesus because you're representing him, don't be discouraged. Be happy. He talks about the reality. He talks about the response. He talks about the receiving. Notice he says this. You know what God does for you? Look at verse, look at verse 14. If ye be reproached for the name of Christ, happy are ye. Then he puts a semicolon there. Then he says this. For the spirit of glory and of God resteth upon you. Amen. When they're suffering, the spirit of glory and of God is the grace of God in your life. God gives you grace for that trial. God gives you exactly what you need when you're ridiculed, when you're undermined, when you're being criticized, when you've been censured, you put down. Hey, that's what happened Peter and John. They were discouraged there. In Acts chapter 4, they were told no longer to preach in Jesus' name, and they were discouraged what to do. And the Bible says they went back to their own, and they went back to church and told the church what was going on. They had a prayer meeting. Listen, the Spirit of God and the Spirit of glory came upon Peter and John. They were encouraged, because you know what? God sent his great spirit. He, the Bible says that they were, they were, they were given holy bonus to declare, the, Lord, to declare the, the word of the Lord. And then the Bible says great grace came upon them. You know what great grace is? The Spirit of glory of God. When great grace comes upon you, you. Listen, God gives you this peace. This great grace comes upon you. Your strength, his strength is made perfect in weakness. And God, guess what? When God does that, he activates in us the spirit of giving, not the spirit of taking back. But notice something else. Remember, the context here is suffering. He speaks about, a pre, he speaks about here our, the reality of suffering our response to suffering, the receiving of suffering, but then notice very interestingly in the context of all this, verse 15. He speaks about a restriction in suffering. Now, if you read verse 15, it fits right within the context. It's not kind of just in there and you're, where did this come from? <laughs> because he's on the same thought in verse 15. He says, but, but, let none of you suffer, and he gives four things. They're all interconnected. Let none of you suffer as a, what's the first word? Talk to me, class. And what's a murderer? What's a murderer? There's premeditated intent, malicious intent, to harm someone else. Actually, murdering is to taking someone's life. Now, one of the commandments says, thou shalt not what? Kill, Kill. right. He said, now, now, believers, let none of you suffer as a murderer. Now, why did Paul Peter say that? Because I think some of these people that were unsettled were very angry with the Roman government. And you probably heard the chatter in the background. Someone saying, man, if I get my hands on one of those soldiers, I'll kill them. <laughs> and God is saying here, wait a minute. Now, some of you think that that's right thinking. He said, let none of you suffer as a murderer. Well, that's the first thing. But he's not done yet. He said, let none of you suffer as a thief. Now, what's a thief? Someone who premeditates to take something which belongs to someone else. Hey, you know, people have all these cameras there, and if any of you got, you're on next door or things like that, you know, you, you, you can't get away with weekly, especially here in this area of Washington Manor, okay? Every, sing, every single night you get some kind of, a, 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 some, some message of somebody's all mad and angry because their catalytic converter was stolen and their tools out of their truck was stolen or their truck was stolen and, and all these things there. That's why we have security in the parking lot so your car doesn't get stolen, amen, you know? You know what? Those people weren't just walking down the street thinking, oh, that looks cute. I think I'm gonna take the converter. No, they were, there was premeditated intent to steal. Let none of you suffer as a thief. Will you intentionally take what belongs to someone else? Thou shalt not steal. But there's, he's not done. Let none of you suffer as a murderer. Let none of you suffer as a thief. Let none of you suffer as an evildoer. Same idea, same wave of thought. What's an evildoer? Malicious intent of doing it. Someone who perpetually and constantly and consistently does evil. You know what the word evil it can be translated to? Criminal. Criminal intent. It means a criminal mindset. Always doing evil. They're evil in their mind. That's the description of Satan. Amen? Right. 
Satan always does evil. Don't fool yourself. Satan doesn't do anything good. But he has a fourth word that he throws right into there. Let none of you suffer as a murderer, as a thief. He says, let none of you suffer here as an evildoer. And then he says, or as a busybody in other men's matters. Busybody. Now, the word busybody in the New Testament is found three times. Two of those times, the meanings is the same. It's basically the annoying idea of someone sticking their nose into other people's business. It's where they're just being annoying. That's not the word used here in verse 15. The word here used in verse 15 is two words that become one compound word. It's a word that when we break it up, it's two, word, it's two meanings combined to one. The first word that's part of this compound says not one's own. The second word of this compound is the word overseer. The word episkopos means overseer. Episkopos is a word that describes the office of the pastor. We translate it to the word oversight, overseer, or bishop. Several words are used to describe the office of the pastor. Poimon, which means he's a shepherd. He's to feed the flock. The word elder, which has the idea where he speaks of the maturity of the man, the maturity of the office, okay? Uh, it speaks about pastor-teacher, okay? But then there's the word episkopos, which speaks about the leadership or taking the oversight thereof. It basically means that in the affairs of the entire church, the pastor has the oversight responsibility over everything that happens in church. That's why when things go on in the church, you're supposed to let your pastor know because the pastor is not Jesus Christ who has eyes everywhere. You're supposed to let your pastor know because he has oversight. over. He's responsible for everyone's soul. He's responsible for everyone's work there. But the word oversight was a popular word. Episkopos was a very popular word that was used in the the first century. It meant someone that has oversight thereof. Now, in a positive sense, the word oversight is a good word. It's a leadership word. It's a positive word. It means, it means having oversight over things, and it has a great idea. But when combined as one word, and this one word that's used here in verse 15, it's used in a very negative manner. And used here in verse 15, it means a person who is intentionally trying to oversee or control someone else's life or affairs. Not one's overseer. Not one's overseer. Let none of you suffer as a busybody. And he equates it as bad as being involved with murder, stealing, or evildoer. I think we all agree with the fact we're not supposed to hurt other people. I think we all agree that we're not supposed to take advantage of other people. I think we all agree that we're to have good hearts and not to be malicious and evildoers. I think we all agree with that. But he's saying here, verse 15, we're not to be people or allow other people to be so controlling that they adversely want to affect your decisions or the outcome of your life. Busybodies. Two implications in this description. The first implication is very clear. God wants no Christian to be characterized as trying to run and ruin the life of other people. The second implication is that God doesn't want you to be someone who's beaten down and adversely being controlled and run where this word busybody, that you're being adversely affecting your life to the place where you're trying to be ruined and destroyed. Peter's saying, would you notice verse 15? Let none of you suffer as a murderer or as a thief or an evildoer or as a trespasser in other men's matters. I'm going to give you the word trespasser as a synonym here. 
It's a precept. This word that's used here is in the context of suffering Christians. And Peter puts a restriction here in giving us a precept and saying, let none of you suffer as a murderer, as a thief, as an evildoer, or as a busybody in other men's matters. Peter saw some things in the first century church. Trespassers go too far. They cross into territory that doesn't belong to them. Like a murderer, they may seek to hurt someone's life. Like a thief, they might seek to take what doesn't belong to them. Or as an evildoer, they repeat what they do over and over again. It's like a, like a perennial criminal in that context. And Peter, if I could sum it up, is saying no meddling here. No trespassing here. But we're not done. We see the presumptuous... We see the precept, which you notice number three, the precarious. I need to hurry. The dangers, the precarious. I want us to consider the dangers of the precariousness of meddling busybodies whose intent is to hurt, to make others suffer. I first want to say this. The key culprit behind all this is the devil. It's the devil. Now, I'm not using escape clause by saying what's always the devil, but it is the devil because he's a murderer from the beginning. And he's a thief. He wants to steal. He wants to steal your joy. He wants to steal your happiness. And he's an evildoer. He's a perpetual evildoer, but he's also an extreme busybody in other men's affairs. So let me give you some things tonight. All of us have areas of our life where we are at risk of trespassers coming in or meddlers coming in and affecting our life's outcome. We have areas of our life. The first area I want you to think about quickly tonight is the area of the heart. The area of the heart. Now I described today the tripart of man. I didn't mean to, but I needed to go into this so people could understand. When Mary gave herself to the Lord, she gave herself spirit, soul, and body. She gave all of herself to God. Your heart... Your heart is your God consciousness and how you, how, you, how you communicate with God. Our heart refers to our affection and our devotion. Paul said in Colossians 3.2, set your affection on things above, not things on the earth. You know what he's talking about? Have your heart up there. Jesus said, where your heart is, there will your treasure be also. The heart always speaks about our devotion. No, it's become a cliche in independent Baptist circles. You know, catch your pastor's heart. I'm convinced 99.9% .9 of people don't even know what they're saying when they say that. Because they say, I want to catch your heart, and they do the opposite of what my heart says. <laughs> we say, I got my wife's heart, I got my husband's heart. Really? And they're trespassers that want to come along the way that want to steal your heart. There are Absaloms sitting at the gate, at the, at the gateway, trying to steal your heart's affection. Now I want to tell you tonight, there are trespassers that are coming at different angles, different ways, that are trying to steal your heart's affection from Jesus Christ. The Bible says, keep thy heart with all diligence, for out of it are the issues of life. How many of you remember your first love with Jesus Christ when you first got saved and that first love for Jesus Christ? Oh man, you just were so in love with Jesus. You didn't know a whole lot about the word of God, but you came to church because you wanted to learn the word of God. You couldn't even find the books of the Bible and you were embarrassed by the fact when someone said, turn to the book of Psalms, you went to the book of Acts, you know what I'm saying? And someone said, well, let's go over to the gospel of Matthew and you went to some other book, but then you started to learn it and you got excited that you memorized and learned the 66 books of the Bible, the order of it, 
it. And you got excited because you could find a book of the Bible without having a thumb index on your Bible. And you got excited when preaching went longer because you said, man, I want more of the word of God. And you got excited when people got saved. And you got excited when folks got made a decision for God. And you got excited when God answered prayer. I'm just saying, in the first love of Jesus Christ, you got excited about those things. You got excited about the first time you got to serving Jesus Christ and you did something for the Lord. You got excited that you got a mop and you started mopping the floors and said, man, I got to clean the house of God. You got excited when you went to the bathrooms and you were asked to wipe, wipe down the bathrooms and mop the floors and, and do all those things and scrub the toilets there. And you got excited when someone said, hey, we've got to stay late up at night with the sound and AV crew because we've got to get these sound boards up or we've got to put the wiring in inside the walls there because we were trying to save the church a lot of money. Or you decided, you know what? Oh, the only time all of our men can meet to do something is 10 o'clock at night. And so the men come at 10 o'clock at night and their wives understandingly and lovingly say, honey, I don't want you to be gone, but go ahead and be gone. We got to take care of the church. And they'll get up at that lift, up on that lift, and that lift will take them all the way to the top of the ceiling here at the risk of their own lives. And they'll change out a light bulb and they'll do some wiring there. They get that all done. They're finished by two o'clock, three o'clock in the morning, barely get any sleep, come home, barely get any sleep, kiss their wife on the cheek. Next thing they know, it's six o'clock. They've got to get up and go back to work. I mean, they did it. They don't complain. They don't talk about it. I mean, first love, they were just excited about serving our Lord Jesus Christ. First love is the very first time you put a dollar offering in the plate and you got excited. You got to put something in there. Then you learned about the principle of tithing. You realize that the tithe is the Lord's. And I'm going to caution you tonight. You look at your donor statements. You compare your donor statements to what you found with the IRS on your 1040. Because if you don't have a 10% correlation, you've been robbing God. But you remember the time you first gave your tithe? Remember the first time you participated in Faith Promise Mission? Somebody say amen. The other day we got a report from Brother Rick Martin. Please continue praying for Mrs. Becky Martin. Brother Martin says thank you to Heritage Baptist Church because we sent him a, we sent him a large love offering, love offering gift to, to help him and his wife because I know that he incurred all these expenses to going down to Tijuana for this alternate treatment for his wife. I know they incurred all these expenses without the church helping them. I, I, I know how poor his church, I don't say poor, but I know that the, the, giving, the giving capacity of a church is not like we give here in the United States. I don't say poor, that's a bad description there. We reached out, he sent us a letter, and he said, Pastor, please tell the church thank you. We're just overwhelmed. We're speechless to tell you how much we're thankful for what you did for us. And he went on, he says, I want to tell you what, 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 what the dollars that Terridge's Baptist Church has been sending every year over and above your, your offerings is helping us here. Down in the Mindanao area of the Philippines, which many of you know, who are from the Philippines, you know that it's a very strongly uh, Muslim-populated area. There are parts in Mindanao that are very dangerous for Christians to be in. We have several of our missionaries we support over in that area. I've had several invitations. I've turned down several invitations. Would you come over, Pastor Fawn, to come preach? I'm not afraid of going there. It's just that right now with COVID and everything, I just don't think, I don't want to be locked down and quarantined and stuck over in the Philippines for the next six months, amen? <laughs> Brother Doug Sisson, he led Manny Pacquiao's wife to Christ, amen. Right there in the heart of General Santos. We have one of our church members, Marva Gonriquez, has family all over Davao. She's been giving the gospel to them all during COVID. She got fired up. She was tired of being at home. And she said, I got to do something. And when she heard me say, hey, we we're starting this prayer works ministry, she started saying, you know what? I'm going to invite my friends and my family to watch. She had several family watch. We had one service during the summer where I preached away the gospel. And listen, several family members sent back response. Brother Justin saw it. They sent back response. We trusted Jesus Christ, our Savior. I got excited. But remember, you get those reports, and Brother, Brother Martin sent us a report the other day to just explain. He says, Pastor, I just want you to know, we've got families out of our church that are so burdened for families in parts of Mindanao where there is just, there is just great suffering, great difficulty. And he sent us pictures of our, their members that went down there and brought the gospel. And he's showing us pictures after pictures after pictures of children that we sent money to. They bought gifts to give to children. These children had never received a toy in their life. And I'm talking about a cheap piece of toy. Listen, what we give our kids compared to kids in other countries, our kids are millionaires. A little rattle is considered very expensive for a little kid over there. 
Little kid, I saw this little kid there holding a rattle the other day, holding that, just a big smile on his face, excited about having this little rattle. That, I, mean, I mean, I can imagine a baby being happy with a rattle, but a five-year-old? And I saw these women who are, from their birth up, they were persuaded to put their faith in the Muslim belief. And the Muslim belief does not believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God who died for their sins and rose again from the dead. But they put their faith in Jesus Christ when those faithful soul winners from Elo Baptist Church went there and told them about Jesus Christ. They got saved. Hey, do you remember getting excited about reports of salvation? Remember getting excited about when people got saved? Remember getting excited about the first time your kid came to Sunday school and heard the gospel and they got saved? Hey, that's first love with Jesus. But I want to tell you, somebody came along and trespassed into your heart and got involved with your devotion and they started messing with your head and messing with your time. And all of a sudden, you just slowly, slowly over time, just, oh, that's great. Mm -hmm. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Or worse yet, you don't even say anything. Now, Baptists are supposed to be ameners, amen? The busybodies of busyness and worldly distractions and amusements and the non essentials start to encroach into your affection for Jesus Christ. The busybodies of envy and jealousy and bitterness and wrath that mess with our heart's devotion. And hey, you remember Paul had a friend by the name of Demas? Demas was his gospel companion. The book of Philemon, he commends Demas before T Paul had his head chopped off his head. He says, Demas hath forsaken me, having loved this present world. Demas was affected by worldly busybodies. Remember Simon the magician? He says something about him Wednesday night. You didn't hear Wednesday night? You need to hear Wednesday night's message. Examine yourselves whether you be in the faith. Some of the magician attached himself to Philip. He led Philip to believe he was saved. He led Philip to believe that, that he was just like one of us. When Peter and John came, Peter snuffed him out. Peter said, Simon, your problem is you have the gall of bitterness and you're in the bondage of iniquity. And I said Wednesday night, bitterness and bondage always go together. They always do. The Bible says it. And Simon led his desire for control and power and the fact that he was a narcissist. Control his thinking to where he didn't get saved. Pastor, how do you know you didn't get saved? Because Peter said, he said, you better go repent of your sin before God. And here's what Simon's response. Would you pray for me? Would you pray for me that none of these things you said will come upon me? That man never got saved. They're trespassers of the heart. Hey, hey, I'm not done yet. They're trespassers of the head. What you think about says everything about you. Your mind and thoughts are where the battle for control begins. Strongholds develop through our minds. Defiling thoughts come from hearing wicked words like cursing, swearing, dirty jokes. If you're around that stuff, you've got to either put some earplugs on or you better change your job. Didn't hear a lot of amens on that. Defiling thoughts here come from hearing wicked words. It comes from looking at inappropriate images. It comes from reading corrupt literature. With all of these things combined together, meddle with our minds. Where it's like that word that's used for busybody. It's a controlling of our minds. Its goal is to control to the ruin of the mind. Discouraging thoughts meddle with our ability to be positive and happy. Let me say something tonight. Please listen to me tonight. Because I don't want to sound like I'm unsympathetic or I don't understand or I don't care. I understand. If your family background you came out of was harsh, and I don't even want to use the word abusive because I'm sick and tired of the word abusive being used to an extreme that God never meant the word abusive to be used. 
but you may have come out of a harsh family background where everything you did was not perfect enough. And everything you did, you felt beaten down and you felt insecure, you felt inferior, and you're dealing with a lot of insecurities in your life. But I want to tell you something tonight. When Jesus Christ came into your life, he gave you power over those insecurities. And with Jesus Christ, listen, God said he's given us the spirit that of power. That is dunamis power. It's the same power that saves us from sin. It's the same power that takes us to heaven. It's the same power that raised Jesus from the dead. I'm telling you tonight, don't fall for the devil's lie that you have to live the rest of your life with insecurities that are going to tear you apart. You've got Jesus in your life. Power. And love. You can love unlovable people. Doesn't mean they're going to love you. Every one of us needs to be baptized in 1 Corinthians 13. You say, well, that's a Valentine's Day passage. No. It's a day-to-day passage as we battle with loving people. Because none of us love like God loves. If you've got a chip on your shoulder, you've got a grief you have with somebody else, you're not loving like Jesus does. You're not. Love thinketh no evil. Charity covereth the multitude of sins. Let me just say this tonight. I can tell when somebody's going sideways against Jesus and against the church, and I can almost guess it's because they're reading, they're reading, or watching videos, or reading stuff that it's unbiblical. Now I'm going to preach a message about what wise counsel is very so, soon because I, 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 I'm, I'm up to here right now. I'm up to here. In fact, I'm past that right now. People ask me for counsel and they do the opposite of what the Bible says. Now, I'm going to tell you right now, this is counsel. I said right now is counsel. This is counsel right now. Don't go to sleep in church. You're getting counsel. The word of God is counsel. The word of the Lord is perfect, converting the soul. The statue of the Lord are right, rejoice the heart. The commandment of the Lord is pure, enlightening the eyes. Listen. The testimonies of the Lord are sure, making wise the simple. That's counsel. Trespassers are messing with our mind. Listen, if you're listening, if you're reading all this other kind of stuff that's out there that criticizes independent Baptist churches and criticizes our fundamental beliefs and criticizes all these different things, and I understand, listen to me tonight. My my goal is, Please catch my heart on this tonight. My goal is not for Heritage Baptist Church to be a mimic of somebody else's church. We are God's word to mimic what the New Testament church is to be out of the Bible. And whatever somebody else does, God bless them. Let them do what they've got to do. But I've got to lead this church to do what God wants us to do. And we're to win this world for Christ, to Christ. We've got to find every way. Listen, when, when everything got shut down, everything got shut down uh, last year there, everybody's sitting around twiddling their thumbs trying to figure out what to do. I said, I can't do that. I said, if we don't get something going, our evangelistic fire is going to be gone. And you'll hear in the report next Sunday night, we had close to 100 people trust Jesus Christ as Savior, and a good number of them are in the church right now. And a good number of them watching by live stream right now. Trespassers mess with your head. The busybodies of distractions, wrong literature, television, time, things to suck up your time. This old pastor, what kind of mind am I supposed to have? You're supposed to have the mind of Christ. Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. There's one more I want to give you. I know it's late, but i got to give this to you tonight. Brother, Brother Lett made you happy. I'm giving you back to earth. Amen. you got to be happy. you got to be holy, too. Amen. This is a precarious of the heart. This is precarious of the head. This is a precarious of the home.
Our homes are at risk of being meddled with. And trespassers coming in. You know what the prophet said to Hezekiah? What have they seen in thy house? Amen. What did they see in your house? Now, first of all, I want to give you some things because I can get a whole mess. I got to go quickly. First of all, I want to talk to every married couple here tonight, a prospective married couple. Remember Genesis 2.24 and Matthew 19.5? The principle of marriage is, therefore shall a man leave his father, and man, by the way, is encompassing the man and the woman. Therefore shall a man leave his father and his mother and shall cleave to his wife, and they too shall become one flesh. Jesus repeated that in Matthew 19, 5. Paul repeats that in Ephesians chapter 5. So that means if it's repeated three times by Jesus, by Paul, and by God himself, we better listen. When you made your vows, when you made your vows, you were establishing a covenant before the eyes of God with your spouse. And in those vows, and I think Brother Aaron asked me for a sample of what, what we people will read. I'll have them repeat when I do a wedding. You may have forgotten, but you pledge ladies to be his wife and men to be her husband. Spirit, soul, and body. It does not mean leaving father and mother. It does not mean abandoning your parents. It does not mean you don't see your parents anymore. It does not mean, it does not mean that you cannot, you know, that you're not to care for your parents. What it does mean is you're leaving the security and comfort of always running to mommy and daddy for things, which includes your siblings. I said, which includes your siblings. And with your spouse, you're building a home where Jesus Christ is the foundation. With Jesus Christ as your foundation, the goal of marriage is very simple. You're to become like sticky glue. You're to have a crazy glue marriage. That's probably a good, hey, that's probably a good thing, Brother Ern, for this year's marriage conference. Crazy glue, amen? Or gorilla glue. You can figure out which one's the gorilla, amen, you know? You know what's happening? I'm speaking to a lot of our younger couples right now. You better guard your marriage from interference. Who are you getting your counsel from? Hey, listen, you know when God wrote Genesis 2.24, God knew, God knew the inadequacies of the husband and the inadequacies of the wife. You're to learn together. You're to appreciate each other. You're to grow together in Jesus Christ. Now, that doesn't mean, that doesn't mean your parents step back and they're not trying to be God. Listen, your parents love you, amen? They love you. They want the best for you. But when family, family wants to control your life, then at that part, they're not violating a Bible principle. Or you want to get involved in trying to control somebody else's life, you're violating a Bible principle. Now listen to me tonight, I'm gonna to say this statement, because I've been, I've been doing this a long time now. If family members hold some kind of leverage in your marriage emotionally, financially, traditionally, or legally, and that covers everything. Emotionally, financially, traditionally, or legally, and trying to control you, they're impeding the biblical rule that says husbands and wives are to cleave to one another. You think about that for a minute. Now I realize we have a lot of cultures in here. But culture will oftentimes conflict with the Bible. We do it this way. No, we do it this way. What about our traditions? What about them? 
Traditions have their proper place, but not when they conflict with the word of God. And you remember those words tonight, because one day it's going to come back and haunt you. If your family or somebody you have holds some kind of leverage in your life, financially, emotionally, or whatever, why, you be careful because they're now trespassing into a place they're not supposed to be. They're in a domain they never were meant to be in. You're in a domain you're not supposed to be in if you're doing that. Secondly, trespassing mentally occurs in our home when husbands and wives are not fulfilling the biblical roles given in Ephesians 5, 22, 30. You know, I'm sick and tired. Listen, I'm just going to tell you my heart tonight. I'm so tired of marriage conferences and an abundance of marriage books that talk about what God summarized in 10 verses in Ephesians 5, 22 to 33, how to have a godly, successful marriage. I can name you all the authors. You know the problem is? We're not fulfilling our biblical roles. Wives, submit yourselves unto your own husbands. You only have one husband. That is who you follow in leadership. She said, well, he's not a good leader. Well, then you know what? Help his leadership. I'm constantly trying to mentor young men. A lot of them, pastor, I can't. Listen, you can do it. And that's why you're to cleave together, because you're to help one another. You said, well, I'm looking for, you know, it's like, like some, some of these young ladies back years ago, they said, Pastor, I'm looking for this description of a husband, and they were giving me a description that matched the Apostle Paul, and I said, don't, don't pray for that. That's why he was single. Figure that one out. He said, well, my father, my, listen, every husband, every wife is not everything you think they should be. They're everything what you need. I said, they're everything you need because God loves you. God loves your home. God loves your marriage. Husbands love your wives, even as Christ loved the church and gave himself for it. I could say so many things on that. Trespassers and meddlers. Third, trespassing meddling occurs in our homes when academics, family influences, worldly amusements, sports, or other activities interfere with our children and parents having a heart for God. Now, I'm not saying you shouldn't have any of those things. I'm not saying you shouldn't have any of those things. We need to have, hey, kids need to have a busy schedule. But listen to, listen to me tonight. Some of us are so busy with activities, we've got them doing everything, but we're not building their character. Now, look at all these parents. I mean, you know the shift that's happened to us reaching children these days? I'm talking about Chinese children, Asian children. They've got, these parents got their kids in everything from Friday through Sunday, even through Sunday afternoon. It's nonstop. I mean, immersion class after immersion class after immersion class. Basically, it's, it's, they're, they're paying someone to babysit their kids so they can do their thing. They want to keep, and I understand, they want to keep their kids busy. You know, the end result is, I look at all these kids, and they don't have character. And so your kid ought to be in glow ministry because we're trying to teach your kid character. Amen. Let me say for children's workers, you get tired in the work. I know you get tired in the work. Get tired in the work. Don't get tired of the work. Be not weary and well-doing. Listen, if we don't have children we're reaching, we don't have children we're winning for Christ, we're going we're gonna to lose one generation very quickly here. You feel like, man, I'm past that. Well, then, you know, you need to step out. Let me put somebody in there that loves children out, and they'll take care of that. Amen? I'm a little bit older than some of you, but I'm going to tell you right now, I love children more than you children workers do. You need to love those children and do something for them and love them and say, I don't have time. Well, make some time. Listen, you cannot tell your child you don't have time for them. Make time for your child. I told the parents yesterday in the parenting seminar, I said, listen, I, I remember a man, a very successful, I was 25 years old, a successful businessman got up and started telling us about how he did all these things. And this is back in the day when a six-figure income was a lot of money. I know it's still a lot of money, but I mean it's a lot of money. And he's telling us about his discipline, telling us about his work schedule, telling us, and all everybody's there taking notes and all things. But the part I remember the most, I don't remember anything he said about how he became successful, but I do remember this one statement he made. Someone asked him a question. They said, hey, when do you see your family? Because he worked from dusk to midnight, literally. His niche was working medical professionals. He had to see them anytime. You know, medical professionals, the residents and interns, so forth, all that. You're kind of the dictator of their schedule. So he just, he just made himself available. He'd, he'd have coffee with people at three o'clock in the morning. And he was successful. I mean, he was making half a million dollars a year. He's 35 years old, making half a million dollars a year at a time when probably half a million dollars today is probably two million dollars today. But here's what I remember most He said, Well, I have 
quality. I only see my kids on the weekend, but I have quality time with my children. And I'm going to tell you something tonight. You cannot have quality time if you don't have quantity time. That is a lie. I have quality time. Your kids don't see you. Good night. Your kids need you. Your grandchildren need you. You're trespassers. The devil's the master trespasser, the master meddler. But let none of you suffer as murderers or thieves or evildoers or as a busybody in other men's matters. I need to close. Let me give you one more thought. I want you to see the preemption. Peter said, no, you're going to suffer as a Christian. Do not suffer either as the one doing it or the one receiving it. <laughs> Let no man suffer as a busybody. Let me give you some preemption. First of all, beginning tonight at the altar, build high walls and strong towers as fortresses of protection for your life and your home. Just putting trespass, no trespassing signs up is not going to do the job. Joash, Joash told Amaziah he was meddling to his hurt. Fortify your marriage, your life, and your children in God's word and prayer. The name of the Lord is a strong tower. Amen. The righteous runneth into it and is safe. Right. Amen. Number two, don't give place to the devil. Hey, look up here. A lot of you, a lot of you brought the devil in as a tenant in your home. Yeah, you did. You brought the devil in as a tenant. He's a squatter in your home. You know, I have to say, kick him out. I said, kick him out. You better start examining everything going on in your home where he's made some trespasses. You better kick the devil out and kick back your home. Neither give place to the devil. I'm tired of God's people coming to church. They're all worn out. They're all weary. They've lived a life of sin. They've got all these difficulties. They come to church. We put on our fundamental smiles. We look like we're doing okay here. But deep down inside, we're miserable people because we're not living right. Things aren't right. You know why? Because the devil's living in your house as a squatter. Get the devil out of your house. He's messing with your devotion time. He's messing with your prayer time. He's messing with your spousal time. He's messing because you've got everything going on except the most important thing. Except the Lord build the house. They labor in vain that build it. Number three, confess and forsake the sin of being a meddler or lying meddlers to control your life. Get out from that nonsense. Take out the garbage, amen? Yes. Fourth, whatever imperfections are in your life and home, leave it to God. Why meddlest thou to thy hurt that thou shouldest fall? That's what the Bible says. Guard your heart. Guard your head. Guard your home. Let's stand.